Who? To the... Am I in a frame? You are. Okay, sweet. Welcome to um, the Close Force training session. Um, I'm sorry that we have to begin this morning with such a, I guess, robust topic such as, as student conduct, but it, it is important. Um, my name is Jesse Hurst. I have been affiliated with this university since an undergrad in 1997. Um, I was around when the very first club sports program or team came on campus, which was uh, the UM Flint Hitmen. I don't know if you all remember that, but that was a hockey club. I think they, they came on in, in the early 2000s. Um, when I transitioned from a student to an employee in the Office of Student Life, um, I helped to establish the club sports program. Um, I still remember the very first club sports team that came to me. It was the Women's Flat Track Roller Derby Club. Um, I remember they rolled me under the bus too. <laughs> but um, but I, I was happy to to, to get them established, and then from there, um, the current men's hockey club came on board, and then from there, it was the football club, and then from there, it was the soccer men's soccer club, and we had to make a decision of, of supporting uh, the growing club sports effort um, on campus. So, so we were able to do that in a, I can't recall, the, the late 2000, like 2008, nine, somewhere around there, seven, and, you know, happy to see that you all are here, present today, ready to rock and roll and, and, and represent your your competitive spirits, your your passions for for sports and this university all in the same measure. So Stacy mentioned that that you all are now sponsored student organizations, right? So what that means is when you're out there competing. The front of your jersey will have either the U and Flint logo or the U and Flint name. And that's what you're representing at all times. What I realized in my role at, from in student conduct now is that not a lot of students know about our, our conduct process, what it means, why do we have it. Uh, they really don't know that it exists until they come to my office because they messed up. Right? So, show of hands, how many of you have seen or heard of this document? The Statement of Student Rights and Responsibilities. Great, <laughs> one student, that's awesome. <laughs> so, the, the presentation that I got here is called Student Conduct 101. Before I go through it, a couple things. I had to use this Prezi account, I hate Prezi. <laughs> but I had to use it because this is the only place that it was saved, saved and stored. Um, and I refused to pay the $21.95 or whatever to get a Prezi Pro account and download it as a PDF. That was just, that's robbery to me, right? So, in updating this, it won't let me save it so that I can go through it as a, as a real presentation. So we're going to see it from the edited version. Same content, I just wanted to throw that out there so you guys don't think that I'm just being lazy and, and like I do just play the presentation. Okay, so, so, so we're going to look at it from the edited version. Don't judge me. I'm sorry. And, um, and as we go along, if you have any questions, please let me know. One more thing, just to throw out, because my time is short for it with you guys today. I'm going to speed through a couple of these slides, but I'll slow down and really talk about the, the, the most important and critical aspects in, as it relates to you all as student athletes. Okay? So this is Student Conduct 101, yay. <laughs> On the agenda today, we're gonna to talk about the conduct process. You guys can see this, correct? Okay, the, the conduct philosophy we have and I'll answer any questions that, that you all may have. So, as I stated the, the, in the Statement of Student Rights and Responsibilities, it, it, it's this, you know, the, the, the balance between, you know, doing right and fair and upholding the, the laws, policies, and procedures that we have on campus. So, the statement was designed to help maintain an atmosphere that is conducive to academic pursuits, 
The university recognizes its, its responsibilities to all members of the community and the personal protection and institutional rights. And inappropriate behavior is often symptomatic of attitudes, misconceptions, and or an emotional crisis, right? So this is like basically the, the confines of why this document was, was created and established. Stay with me, folks. I'll explain why this matters to you all in your context in a moment. So conduct is an integral part of the educational mission. UN Flip mission is to promote academic and personal development. And each individual, which includes you all as students and student athletes, must accept and understand their own personal and social responsibilities. So what are those responsibilities? Respect for the law, regulation, and policies. Respect for self and others. Understanding that an educational process can include suspension and expulsion. A violation is simply a violation. There is no gray area. If it's a violation of a policy or a statement, that's a violation. We must go through the process together. A student's background and circumstance may impact the reaction and motivation for the behavior, but it does not impact whether the student is found responsible if evidence leads to that determination. Okay. So, most of the time when there's a conduct process, the people don't come in willingly. You know, nobody's barging in my office like, yeah, Jesse, I'm ready to meet with you because I did it. I got a job, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's benefits that you can gain from it. Um, what I like to, to say is, is is okay, you, you will learn from that mistake and then you will make the right next decision. That's my, that's my goal as a conduct officer, to help students understand why making these missteps, A, why did they do it, to get underneath the surface and, and, and really dig deep, and then B, to help them to not make the same mistake twice. Okay, so this is kind of how the, the I, I try to use the learning outcomes and, and and the, I guess, sanctioning philosophies that it's not all punitive. I, I, you know, just because you, you made a mistake doesn't mean it's the end of the world and, and you, you know, you we're going to suspend your, your program or revoke your rights. You know, we're, we're going to work with you to make sure that you don't do it again. Now, if repeated behavior continues, then we will have to take more drastic measures. Okay? So what does it mean to be a student leader at U of M Flint? How many of you all are student leaders? I should see every hand raised. Raise them, I need to see them. This is you. This is what it means to be a member of the club sports community. To have a goal of developing mature men and women and a goal to pursue excellence. It's an inclusive community where individuals are with different values and beliefs are accepted and respected by maintaining effective communication. And it's a just community that appreciates diversity and honors and respects everyone's rights. This is civility. This is important. It's very important, too, to, to maintain a level of civility even when you're in the heat of competition, OK? So keep in mind these community values and what, what we expect from you all when you're out there competing and, and you're representing that block M on, on the front of your jerseys in, in uniforms um, as, as you compete throughout the, the, the state and nation. So, you might be asking, what jurisdiction does the, this office, the, the, the university, have for students that violate policies, procedures, rules, and laws? A student, a student organization, or a person who has submitted an application for admission will be subject to the Student Code of Conduct, which is the Statement of uh, Student Rights and Responsibilities, for any violation that occurs on university property at university-sponsored events or off campus. Now, are your events university-sponsored events? How many of you say yes? If you say yes. <laughs> You get a prize, because nobody's away. Now, OK, come on in, buddy. Welcome back. 
How many of you believe that your events are university sponsored events? Okay. Now, for those of you who don't think your events are university sponsored, are you taking classes here? Yes or no? Yes. Awesome. So anything you do that's in, in violation of this document or the club sports handbook or the rec center policies are subject to disciplinary action. I can sit down now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I say it like that because most people don't understand it. They don't get it until they come in and they meet with me and they're like, why am I here? And I have to go through this part. And, and then we can get to the root of the issue. So as long as you all understand that, that any of those violations are, are, are held under the jurisdiction of the Student Conduct Office, then we'll be all set. What are some of the violations? Um, I just put a few on here. You probably can't read them all. Violence or threat of violence, death or damage, defacing uh, of property and destruction. You know, the, uh, what's that guy's name? Ryan, Ryan Lochte. Yeah. That. <laughs> um, non compliance with requests or orders of, of university officials. So if, if, if Gary says something and you all are, are, are not in compliance with him, that is a violation. Uh, provided false information, uh, the possession or use of firearms or weapons, disorderly conduct, which can, has a very broad definition, and we put it in there for a specific reason because it has a very broad definition. Lewd, obscene, or indecent behavior. I was play football. Okay. Um, <laughs> Verbal or written physical abuse, threats, intimidation, or harassment, um, conduct that constitutes unlawful discrimination or harassment, possession, use, delivery, a sale, a distribution, a controlled substance, or drug paraphernalia, and on this campus, if it's alcohol, if it's not a sanctioned event, because can't drink alcohol on campus or at university sponsored events that are, that are not sanctioned for that. Any act that could, viol that could constitute a violation of, of the local law or ordinances, I don't know why this says the state of Florida, and misuse of alcoholic beverages. Okay. One more thing on that list that, that's not there is this thing called um, uh, sexual misconduct. And that's a whole nother presentation that, that I'm quite sure somebody will do with you uh, and sit down and talk to you about that soon. So some of the common uh, cases for violations, so you have for individuals, alcohol misuse or drug use, harassment, classroom disruptions, and housing issues on our campus. For organizations, it's, it's usually unregistered events, um, any type of hazing or harassment uh, issues, um, alcohol misuse and then irresponsible spending. That's what we see a lot of. And, and I, I just need you all to understand that the, the policies that are outlined in your handbook constitutes a violation. So, so you have to abide by it. those rules and the rules that are outlined in here. So, say for instance, Hey, I used to, the cheer team gets sanctioned, right? So, the cheer team did something that you probably shouldn't have done. I don't know. You. You all jumped on the public safety, um, what you call those things? The go karts. The go karts, yeah. And <laughs> you know I got keys to that, right? Yeah, I know, that's why I'm, <laughs> and that's why I'm bitching. That. Yeah, so you all jumped on the, the, the public safety go kart and, like, like, parked it at a remote location in Flint and, like, right. took pictures and posted it on Instagram and, and Snapchat. Okay? <laughs> Just hype that. <laughs> so when you come in and you meet with a conduct officer, the intended sanction in this to make sure that you learn from the experience, to educate you so you don't commit the violation again, to ensure that the university expectations regarding behaviors are clear, again, to educate on how the behavior impacts others in the community, 
and to protect members of the community and this educational mission. Because DPS was like, man, where is my go-kart? You know? Like, we have to protect those vested interests. These are like some of the, the, the typical sanctions that may happen. Educational activities, counseling assessment, community service, probation, restitution is one that I should have put on here uh, that we, we do a lot of. So, you know, if you damage something, you're paying it back, things of that nature. On the higher end scale, there's a termination of, of, of a housing contract or a restriction of privileges, um, a revocation of admissions, and then suspension and expulsion. This is, just talks about the differences between the legal process and the statement. So, basically, the in in the student conduct realm, you're either found responsible or not. In a criminal court, you're either found guilty or not. So, there's a higher threshold of you being found guilty. So, uh, I'll talk about all of that in in, in a little bit. So. This is how the process works. A complaint or incident comes into to the student conduct office. It's investigated by the, the, by the conduct officer. If there's, if the facts doesn't lead to a determination of, uh, of, a, of a policy violation, usually the, the matter is, is, is closed. There's some type of mutual agreement or mediation that, tra that transpires. Um, we'll put that, that agreement in writing, we'll, we'll move on. For instance, um, there may be, I don't know, like a contract behavior, or behavioral contract, I mean, that, that says that, and I'll use the cheer club again, the cheer club will refrain from stealing the you and Flint go-kart and taking it on joyride. Right. If there's also cases where um, in, in serious matters where emergency measures could be, could be utilized. Um, uh, so I was trying to think of a, a quick example that may, that may re respond regularly with here. So um, there was a fight between hockey players at, on, on the team bus, right? So, you know, we can take interim, interim measures against one or both of the individuals that are involved. And some of those can be an interim suspension, a, a removal from, from, um, from participating in activities, things of that nature. From here, if there are charges in, in the investigation leads that, that indeed the, the rules were broken, the, the statement <coughs> was violated, the, uh, Club Sports Manual policy was violated, then a notice of charges would be sent to, to the individual or the student organization. Usually that comes back to the student um, conduct office, and there will be a student conduct administrative hearing where the evidence will be presented to you. Um, any witness statements, etc., will be given to you. The student or the student organization will then have an opportunity to, to bring their evidence to substantiate their innocence, any witnesses, etc. From there, you can decide how you want the matter adjudicated. So we can continue to sit with, with the student conduct officer and, 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 and continue to have an administrative hearing. Or you can say, I want this matter heard before a body of my peers. Please send this to the student conduct board. And I'll talk about all that. So if the student is found, or the organization is found responsible, so they will either accept the sanctions or appeal them. And if they are appealed, then the faculty students' concerns committee will either uh, it, it grant their, their appeal or uphold it. If the club decides that, or the student decides that they want a hearing, then we will set up the, the conduct board, which is a group of uh, five students that, rep that are representative across the campus community. They will hear the information. Um, the conduct office will present the, the information in, in regards to the violation. 
the student or student organization will uh, present their common argument. The board will make their decision. They will put their decision in writing, which includes a, a statement of responsibility of, of whether or not they were found responsible and the sanctions. And then from there, the club can either appeal it to to the vice chancellor, uh, inclusion of campus life, or they can accept it and just move on. So, your purpose being here, um, <clears throat> all of you have influence. So, I need you to use your influence with your teammates and, and with your colleagues to, to, if you see any, any behavior, any, any, anything that can constitute a violation, anything that remotely looks like it's going to lead you down a path that you don't want to go on, address it immediately. Um, and you can empathize with them um, and, and, and be more understanding, but, but I just it's important that you take the opportunity to, to not try to sweep any type of issues under the rug, but, but address them immediately. Bring them to Stacey's attention. Bring them to Teresa's attention. Gary's attention. I will say me, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you also have a best interest in maintaining a safe and civil environment where all individuals are treated uh, with, with respect and dignity. So, like I said earlier, no matter how heated the competition is, I need you all to understand that you are representing the block him at all times. So this is what we expect from you, to report any suspicious event, activity, or threatening behavior, or disruptive behavior. And to keep everything that you see and hear confidential. The last thing that you want to do is go around and, and, and start spreading um, information on social media and other outlets that could um, that could negatively impact <coughs> the individuals involved and the campus community. So, so just ma maintain a level of confidentiality, and that will go a long way. So, in upholding the policy, we're like this is mainly for the student conduct board. I'm sorry. I'll put this in here too to to kind of give you an idea of some of the the ways that we would dig to find facts regarding the case. Um, always ask open-ended questions, hypothetical questions and timelines. Don't ask like leading questions or multiple choice questions. I've never asked a question I already know the answer to. Like I learned that from a lawyer. So um, uh, when you come in, if you come into the office, if, I can guarantee you that it would be a fair a fair process, but just be prepared to answer some tough questions because as the conduct officers, we want to get beneath the surface to find out the real root of the problem. So in order to do that, we have to dig deep. So here, in deciding whether or not a violation occurred, the campus threshold is a preponderance of evidence. Which means that is it more likely than not that the student or the student organization that was charged violated the statement of student rights and responsibilities? So that's our question. So basically, it's 51%. If you look at that, that, that ballot scale that I had earlier, 51%, if 51 says, like, okay, yes, this is probably a violation, then that's the, the threshold that we use. My personal um, stance is I try to be clear and convincing. So their clear convincing evidence means that it, be, it, it, it leaves no doubt. Well, actually, that's reasonable doubt. Um, clear and convincing means that 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 you know it's about seventy five percent certain that a violation occurred. In the courts, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so. Just to let you know the, the different thresholds that we will use when, when determining whether or not a violation occurred. It, it's, it's always the preponderance of evidence, 51% likely that it happened. Anybody got a question? Okay. So how are the determinations made? We find the facts of the case, 
Do the facts reach a preponderance of evidence that the student or the organization is responsible? What are the core issues? Was it a real problem? Find a responsibility and not, you know, like I said, the 50, more than 50% sure that the student violated the, the policy. And then there's recommended sanctions. These are the questions that we will ask. Was the, was the campus or community resources uh, could be provided uh, in a learning growth measure for, for the core issues or the area? What is appropriate for, for our community's behavior standards and expectations? Is this a first offense or a pattern of behavior? So these are just some of the questions that I will answer as a conduct officer in, in just deciding what sanctions will, will occur or not. The process, like I said, is fair. Uh, we communicate at all times. Uh, definitely communicate alternative perspectives um, to be heard without prejudice. It's honest. Uh, we realize, like, you know, the, the, you're all human, you're going to make mistakes. Um, but you choose the behavior. You also have to choose your consequences. And then we have a le level of integrity to um, legitimize the process to make sure that it's that you are upholding to the expectations that we have. And with that, that's it. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. It ain't no deep questions. So no, no, I don't get all crazy on me. <coughs> no, but um, you know, I'm like top flight everywhere. I do security everywhere. Yes. So when I read the firearm rule, and then I read the rule on and off campus, so like, am I in violation already? If you come on campus with a firearm? No, I know you can't come on campus with a firearm. I work for BPS, so yes, okay. I definitely tell you that every day. Okay. Um, you said on and off campus. And yeah, the university you, sponsored event? Yeah. That's a great area. it's not like a... Just, oh, let me make sure I got my gun. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that, that's a good question. And it's a gray area. And it will actually be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So, like, as a conduct officer, I would have to go through and, and check the, the contract that you have with the facility to make sure that that information is clearly um, outlined in there. And if it is that there are no weapons, then, yeah, it could. Because, you know, it's a real fine line. Say, for instance, the university has a party somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing security that night, mm -hmm. but I'm part of university. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, you're talking about if you work for security. Is that what you mean? I mean, I guess. If, 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 if you're in a working capacity and you have a firearm, like you're on your job. Okay, just, you know, got to ask all the gray no. area questions. No, that's, thank you. No, that's fine. <coughs> yes. So this preponderance of evidence standard, I feel like it's like really low in comparison to like being charged with something, so it could lead to an abnormal amount of false accusations or misleading accusations. And when you're falsely accused, obviously that carries with it a negative connotation, so you could be looked at poorly by your peers. So why is it that we have such a low standard or a low threshold for these things? That's a good question. Um, I believe it's a policy that was outlined by General Counsel and Ann Harbor. <coughs> the threshold that they chose to, to utilize for the University of Michigan system. Um, I know that the conduct office here and the conduct office in Ann Arbor, we strive to have a, a clear and convincing threshold just to, just to make sure that the concern that you've outlined is, is, is it's not happening. So yeah, that's the best question, answer that I have. I mean, and really, they're all just here to keep you safe. Pretty much. So, um, it, you know, if, if you're being accused of something that's really in the interest of your safety, maybe you were doing something that wasn't safe, or maybe maybe it was against somebody that wasn't making them safe. And I think, um, having worked with Jesse on several of these situations, I think uh, um, our office does do a really good <coughs> job of trying to get all the facts and do the right thing by the students, for sure. And it's really about, everyone's focus has always been about um, fairness and keeping everybody in the situation safe. You can see from experience. One of the things that, the principles that we have is we don't jump to conclusions. Like, just because someone is coming in and making an accusation doesn't mean that we automatically take them for their word. We're going to do our due diligence to find out if what if what was stated actually happened. 
and, and get as close to the truth in the middle as we can. <clears throat> so, yes, um, we deal with a lot of GEC students. Do they get the same like handbook and all of the rules and regulations that we have to abide by? Because that's like you know, kids. GEC, if they're not taking classes yet, Okay. You know, they have to abide by the, the GISD. Oh, okay. But okay. if they if they enroll in one credit, uh, just one credit, then okay. uh, they abide by our rules and, and regulations. Any other questions? Now, thank you all for your listening here. Um, good luck this season. I will be watching you all from afar. Um, It's uh, my last day here at the university is next Friday. Uh, I will be moving on to Oakland University and, and working there. So um, I, I really appreciate working with, with, with you all that I had the opportunity to do so in this room. And I said I, um, I, I will be rooting for you from a distance. Thank you. I call Jesse the historian because when I want to know anything about club sports, I go find Jesse and he can tell me exactly when it started and what happened and how it all came about. So, um, yeah, I have to write the uh, manuscript or something. Or I'll just call you. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> so, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so where we're going to go from here is we're going to take um, about a five minute break. I know some people came in a little later. There's still food over there. Just not okay in my world. So you need to um, get a snack, food, drink, go to the restroom, or whatever. We're just going to take literally five minutes and um, don't move because there's lots of other things to cover. So five minutes. See you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>